do. It's a reminder that we've probably tried some stuff, haven't we? We tried something else, and it wasn't enough, and it wasn't enough. Praise God that we get to gather together this morning on this Palm Sunday. We remember uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, entering into Jerusalem on, on a lowly donkey. What an interesting idea. And um, I'm just uh, happy to be here this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, welcome to Freedom Fellowship. And if you come next week at this time, you came at the wrong time, all right? <laughs> next week, we have two services. We're going to start two services next week, and then we'll continue with two services. And so if you're looking around this morning and you think, man, it's kind of full in here, well, we're making some room, all right? We're going to make some room with two services, and I'm going to encourage you to invite a, a friend, a family, loved one, um, for no other reason than to introduce them to the body of Christ and Christ himself, amen? And I hope that you're sharing your, your faith in Christ with your friends and your family and your neighbors, and that this would just be an overflow of that, that you would come together and enjoy Christ's presence with us as we gather together. So next week, two services, 8.30 and 10.15. And so if you forget that, because you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know two services, and then you wake up on Sunday next week, and you're like, I don't remember. It's on the website. We do have a website. You can go there. You can find that there. And uh, if you have a friend that you're inviting, you can just send them the link to the website, and they can learn who we are, a little bit about who we are, and how to get here, and what time things are, and what things are. But we won't have kids' ministry as well. Uh, there will be um, the nursery open if we have some issues and kids want to go back in there with family or whatnot. But today is Palm Sunday. The Christian church around the world celebrates and remembers Palm Sunday. And for those of us who don't know a lot about the Christian calendar and don't know a lot about what that means, we kind of smile and nod like, yeah, I should probably know what that is. And we think about maybe at some point you saw kids with palm branches, and uh, if you have kids in the downstairs ministry today, they're going to be getting palm branches. And we remember that, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, that there's this whole idea of him riding into Jerusalem on this donkey colt. But today what we're going to be looking at, if you'd like, you can turn to John chapter 12. So we've been in Matthew for a long time. We're going to be in John chapter 12 today. And the title of the message is, For This Purpose I Came. If you're getting into the Easter time of year and you're not preaching about Jesus and talking about what it is that he came to do around Easter, I think uh, there's a problem. And so what we do is we pause and we look directly at what is going on in the Christian calendar when we remember Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem. For some of us who've been in the faith for a long time, these things are reminders year in and year out. And I think that it is appropriate to remember for what purpose did Jesus Christ come? If we can't answer the question, um, we're going to have a very big issue when we meet him face to face on that last day, whatever day that might be, whether he returns and we see him face to face at that time or whether we die and we go to him. The triumphal entry is what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. And, and you know, again, as a church, one of the things is, you know, you come to church, we sing the songs, we do different ministries together. Ultimately, we should be growing in an understanding of Jesus, this relationship of who he is. And there are certain things that we can know headwise uh, that will actually help our heart understanding. If you have um, a, a spouse, you know that you have actually a greater capacity to love them the longer that you know them. But if you're not careful, you will think that you know them, and you'll both continue to grow, and you can actually grow somewhat apart and be married for years and years and actually know each other less because you didn't work and do the effort of knowing each other. And this is what happens in the Christian church all the time. We say a long time ago, at some point in time, my life come to shambles. I realized that I'm a sinner. I realized that I'd separated from God. I realized that I was doing my own thing, going my own way, and in humility... God showed up in my life, and in humility, I realized that I've made a mess of things, and I started to get to know him. And, and I think that um, as we get to know him, we, we need to grow in our head understanding. We really do. And so if you hear the phrase triumphal entry, and that means almost nothing to you, I would encourage you to think upon that phrase, triumphal entry, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. What that means is he comes riding into Jerusalem in triumph, that the entire city is 
stirred into almost chaos. There is a hyper panic almost amongst the people of what is going to happen and, and what does this mean? Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry. And as we've been looking and studying the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, we're jumping forward today into that triumphal entry. Imagine with me that you're going back to that fateful week 2,000 years ago. See, Palm Sunday also kicks off Passion Week, doesn't it? Passion Week. What is Passion Week? That's another weird Christian-type phrase. I remember this movie a long time ago, The Passion of the Christ. Passion Week is the way that Christians describe what it is that Jesus Christ came to do. For this purpose, he came. He had a passion, a soul focus, a holy devotion that he came with purpose to accomplish some great things, amen? And so on this uh, week ahead, every single day through the week, you can find devotions galore for every single day, what it is that Jesus was going through, what the conversations he was having through the gospels and the interactions he was having with people and what it meant in Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and this kind of day of silence, it's interesting, and Thursday and Friday, so often called Good Friday. It's good for us to go back 2,000 years to that week and think about what it meant. So what was happening on this Palm Sunday? Jesus had started his journey into Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews. He had performed many miracles, hadn't he? Most notably at this point, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Last year, I talked about this kind of at length, and I think it's very interesting. You really can't think about Palm Sunday without thinking about Lazarus. Because as Jesus was doing one miracle after another after another, and then he'd escape and he'd disappear, and, 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 and people are wanting to kill him because he's disrupting things. The resurrection of Lazarus from the dead was, was a pinnacle event. It was something that the entire community knew about. This guy who lived close to the temple, who was well-known in the community, died. Stone cold dead. He was dead for four days. Everyone is mourning. Everyone is crying. He was a family friend of Jesus, if you remember that. That, that uh, Martha and Mary were Lazarus' bro- uh, sisters, weren't they? And so when they meet Jesus, if you were only here... You could have done something, but at this point, he's dead. And when he resurrected, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the grave, it was like, I mean, I wish we could just imagine back, right? Imagine if that were to be the case today. Imagine that there was a death of a political figure that was very well known, and so that news went everywhere. That it wasn't like, oh, who was it? Who? What happened? No, the news went everywhere, and then all of a sudden, he's walking and talking, and you, you, you go back through the Gospels, and you'll find, I think it's funny to find Lazarus talking with Jesus after he was resurrected, like, and Lazarus is sitting there talking, and you're like, what a, what a mind-bending, head-twisting situation, and they had to deal with it. The culture had to deal with it. John eleven seventeen. Jesus was such a known figure in the community. He'd been dead four days. John eleven five 5 says that Jesus loved them. He loved their family. John eleven forty eight. 48, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the council are saying, if we let him, speaking of Jesus, if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. That's where we're at when we come into this text today. We come into a text where all of the people in that region, were stirred. They knew Jesus was a big deal. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophecies were being fulfilled. They knew that they knew that they knew that something big was going to happen with Jesus entering into the capital city during Passover where everyone was around. What I want you to understand this morning as we jump into the text is that Israel believed the Savior was there. It wasn't kind of an underground thing where like, oh, like these certain people kind of knew and there was a handful of people watching. It was was cultural, like everyone knew. It was trending, you would say, truly, and not just a haphazard way. It was trending. Something is really happening on this Passover. 
people are being raised from the dead and like people are being healed and this guy keeps showing up and doing things and disappearing and everyone knew, everyone knew. Let's just say it out loud with me. We'll shake you up a little bit this morning. Say, everyone knew. Every, everyone knew. Let's jump into John chapter 12. See what the Lord has for us here today. We're going to read verses 27 through 33. This is Jesus after he's entered into Jerusalem. Your text in verse 12 might say Jesus enters Jerusalem or triumphal entry, something like that. Now we're going to jump into verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled, Jesus said. This is Jesus speaking. That's just a heavy statement right there. My soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, forgive me from this hour. I'm sorry, Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. Verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Wish I had like a cool, booming thunder voice, right? God speaks from heaven. Verse 29, so the crowd of people who stood by and heard it, and they were saying it had thundered, while others were saying, no, it was an angel that had spoken to him. Everyone knew, right? Shaking the culture. There's a voice from heaven. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now judgment is upon this world, and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Amen and amen. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. If I am lifted up, he says, this week and next week, the, the, just a short little series title that I've given it is Lifted Up, that Jesus Christ must be lifted up. It is his rightful place. It is his rightful authority. It is what... It is all that he is due and more. But Jesus at this section says, if I am lifted up, that I will draw all men to myself. It says first that he was troubled. This Greek word, terasso, means to be disturbed, to agitate. The Lord Jesus, he's entered into Jerusalem. They're saying, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're cheering him on, and everyone knew what was going on, and they were excited for what he might do to overthrow the Romans and what this might look like for them to have power and authority, and what would it look like for Jesus, the one who's been doing all these miracles, to take his rightful rule and reign in the capital city. But yet when Jesus starts to speak, he says, man, my soul is troubled. He knows that the cry of the crowd will change, right? Pastor Jeff and I were talking this morning before the service as we usually do and just thinking about how quickly, even online today, when something is trending, how quickly it can change, can it? Someone's on the top, and then the next thing you know, man, they are on the absolute bottom. They're in hiding. Everyone's looking for them. Everybody's beating down their name. They're just tearing them down. And this was Jesus. This is exactly how it went. We know what that would look like. And so his soul was disturbed. It was agitated. It was stirred up. This word literally means to shake to and fro. It was set in motion what needs to remain still. <laughs> if you had a troubled soul, if you experienced that in your life, you know something is coming. You know something's around the bend. You're, you're, you're confident of that. You just don't know exactly maybe how it will go. In Jesus' case, he knew exactly what he was facing. He was troubled. Have you ever had a troubled soul? I know that you have. Maybe waiting for a surgery. I think it would maybe be like that. You know something big is going to happen. You know that it's going to affect your life to some in some way, you're hopeful that all goes well, but you know that it's not going to be easy, and you know there's recovery and all of that. Staring down the barrel of that gun of surgery or conversation that you know that you need to have. Maybe some of us were in court. Jesus faced a court trial, didn't he? 
Maybe in our life, maybe we were guilty and before the court, maybe we were innocent, but still worried, a troubled soul, an agitated spirit stirred up. This was Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday, looking at the cross, looking ahead to what lie before him. Jesus said, what would I say? Save me from this hour? He's like, I know my, my soul is troubled, but what would I say? Save me from this? For this purpose I came. This is what I'm here for. This is what I came to do. He would not shrink back from the cross, would he? What would I say? Save me from this hour. This is the purpose I came. And so the first point for us is this. For this purpose Jesus came to fulfill prophecy. To fulfill prophecy. If you're thinking about the word prophecy, you should... I didn't really write this as a definition, but recorded history coming true. I I want you to think of prophecy in a different way, maybe than culturally the way that we think of it. I think today when we hear about prophecy, because even as I'm writing these points, I'm like struggling. I'm like, what do we people even think when we use these religious words? Fulfilling prophecy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. And it's like, that changes my life. Not at all. I have no idea why that even really matters. We look at prophecy as like fantasy writing. You know, people are so involved with fantasy. They think of things like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, and they're like, oh, oh, the prophets have spoken of old. And you're like, oh, this is a fun story, you know? What if there really were prophets? And then they wrote things down, and then hundreds of years later, those things came true. See, we could argue and debate about the reality of the events of Scripture. You can find people in and around your life, and maybe even you or one of those people would say, I don't really believe the Bible and all that it says. I don't believe the things and the claims that it makes. That's fair enough. But what you cannot deny, it it would make no logical sense whatsoever to deny that the Old Testament wasn't written before the New Testament. Like the Old Testament is clearly very much older by any scholar, historian, anyone would say, yeah, the, well, those documents are much older. And it's not a maybe if the documents were ever written. Literally, some of the oldest written manuscripts that we have in humanity are biblical text. It's biblical manuscripts. This is the oldest stuff that we have. We have Old Testament manuscripts that were written before the New Testament was ever written, and we have them. No one with any intellect whatsoever would say, well, the Old Testament and the New Testament were written around the same time. That's just flat false. So what we have is people, whether you want to debate if they're prophets or not, writing things down, and then later on you have someone shows up in human history, and they start to do things that was spoken of and written down a really long time ago. This is interesting. It should pique our curiosity, to say the least. It would be demanding of our time and effort. It would be worthy of our time and effort to study even a little bit. And I won't go long-winded about all the different prophecies because <laughs> we don't have time for it. For it. But I want, us to look, I want to look at one thing that just kind of struck me this week. I'm like, let's just pick one that's kind of fun. All right, you guys want to do some nerd study with Pastor Ben on something he thought was fun? Yeah, there's three people like, hold on. It's Passover, right? So some of us, again, we're like, oh, yeah, sure. And then some of us are like, I don't know what that is. Passover is a, an event that the Jews have celebrated consistently for thousands of years, every single year. Maybe they did? No, no. All of history, you, again, it's like ask anybody. I don't know why we start parsing things out. They've literally been celebrating Passover for thousands of years. And what it was is when they celebrate, they say, hey, we were a people that were captured in Israel, or I'm sorry, in Egypt. We were under slavery. Miracles happened like crazy. And we got released from an oppressor. An oppressor nation, Egypt, let us all go. We think that's a miracle. We think that's amazing. We're going to celebrate that every single year. And so one of the ways they do that is many Jews would make a voyage into Jerusalem. 
And so this is what Passover is. And what one of the aspects of Passover, again, as, as we know, some of us, that, that the final plague, the plague that was the plague of all plagues, was the death of the firstborn of each of Israel's sons, right? Every single household in all of Egypt, I keep saying Israel, all of Egypt died, and the firstborn of their animals and all that. And there was a way that you could escape the firstborn from dying, that you kill a lamb, and you take its blood, and you paint the blood on the doorposts over the door. So that when this death angel of God comes by, if it sees the blood, then it won't kill the firstborn. It passes over. When you hear Passover, I want you to think of judgment passing over you. This is what it is. And so this is what they were celebrating. And it's not a maybe. The Jews do this today. They celebrate a historic event where they claim something miraculous happened and that this angel of death passed over any household that killed and slayed a lamb and then painted on the doorpost blood. This is what they do. And so what I thought was kind of cool is I had never really studied the Hillel Psalms. H-A-L-L-E-L, the Hillel Psalms. The Hillel Psalms are sung by Jews around Passover. It's Psalms 113 through uh, Psalm 118. Hillel means praise. And so these Jews would praise God during Passover with the Psalms 113 through 118. And if you look through the Psalms, each Psalm kind of has a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a theme to it that illustrates this salvation that illustrates personal sin that they had personally sinned, but God had forgiven them. And as a nation, they had sinned and that God had forgiven them and, and, and that there's redemption in general and that the idols that they had endeavored to worship. I love Psalm 115 is, is a really cool psalm because it says humanity resurrects all these, they, they make all these idols with hands that can't serve, with with eyes that can't see, with tongues that can't speak. It's like, yeah, everything that we've ever created to worship can't do anything for us. And this is what they're celebrating, and this is what they're, they're thinking about. They're thinking about this God who really can save, saved. And this God who really does speak, speaks, even in thunderous voice. This God who really can see, sees me in my circumstance, and he saw us when we were in hardship, and he rescued us. And I thought it would be kind of fun to look at Psalm 118, and this is one of the Hillel Psalms. And so what you want to think about is we're at Passover, and we're in Jerusalem, and the people are singing, and they're shouting, and what they're literally singing is some of these psalms. And this is what they're doing in their families. If you want, you could turn to Psalm 118, but we're going to have it up on the, on the screen here for you. Psalm 118, start in verse 19. It says, open the gates of righteousness. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, for you have become my salvation. So, so again, what we're doing is we're looking at prophecy. We're looking at things that were written hundreds of years ago. No one can argue. It, you could try, but it would be ridiculous. I mean, like, you can always find that person online, right? Uh, okay, whatever. Psalms were written way before the New Testament. And these people are singing and they're remembering God's salvation. And they say, open to me the gates of righteousness and I shall enter through them and I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord and the righteous shall enter through it. Who's the gate? Dude, that's the Sunday school answer wins every time, right? John 10, 7, Jesus said, truly I tell you, I am the gate. I am the door for the sheep. The question for us is that do you enter into a relationship with God through the gate door of Jesus Christ? This is his truth claim that he makes. I am the gate. You've heard it said many, many years ago that the, the righteous will enter in through a gate that the Lord will make this one righteous. He will make anyone righteous who enters in through that gate. Have you, are you entering through some other way? You're like, oh, I know all this weird, you know, weird history stuff. And, but like, you know, I kind of do religion my own way. And like, I just kind of, I know God and it's, it's all good. I'd say warning. 
should not worship a God of your own creation. Warning. You didn't create heaven. You didn't create hell. You didn't create yourself. You should not create your own God. You would be in danger of worshiping a God just like those in Psalm 115, a God that cannot save you. But Jesus makes a claim, and this is the thing. Is he right or is he wrong? He says, I'm the gate. Psalm 118, 22, as this psalm continues, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Some of us, man, our ears are like tingling. We're like, I've heard that before. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do you think the Jews would want to rejoice in, in the deliverance from Egypt? Slavery? Can you imagine if all of us here, all, every single one of us, you know, our culture is in this big uproar about slavery in this nation from many years ago. What if every single family in this room was under slavery just a short time ago? All of us. And then we were thinking back to our history and we're like, yeah, man, like, I'm really happy that I'm not in slavery now. That would be worth rejoicing, would it not? This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, Lord, do save. We beseech you. That's a word we're not much familiar with. Lord, we implore you. Lord, we ask you. We beg you. We plead you. Lord, please do send prosperity. This Psalm 118, 22, this idea of this stone, this cornerstone, is repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Ephesians, 1 Peter. Over and over and over again, they refer back and they say, this is Jesus. This is who he is. Acts 4.1, Luke writes, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders. Luke is looking at the, the religious people and he's like, Jesus was the stone rejected by you. You all know this psalm. He's the chief cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Here's what I'm getting at. The prophecy matters, doesn't it? It's not some fanciful, imaginative stuff. No, this was truly written a long time ago, and now these Jewish people are seeing it unfold in front of them, and everyone knows, and everyone's excited. Psalm 118, 26 says this, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. There's going to be a sacrifice, right? You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God. I extol you. Another interesting word for us. I praise you. I exalt you. I worship you, Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Look at Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. John 12, 13, and they took branches of the palm trees and they went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These people are putting it together, folks, and I know we're Americans and we're kind of slow, but we're putting it together. This was spoken of a long time ago and it's all being fulfilled right in front of us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All of our families would be singing these psalms and remembering these things. It even says, uh, I was reading a commentator that said when Jesus at the Last Supper, it says that they had eaten, and after they had eaten, they sang a psalm. And the contention is they probably sang a Hillel psalm because it was Passover, and they're singing songs about Jesus, and they're looking at him. This is going to get real, you know, and it does. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus enters Jerusalem during Passover, and they shout to him. The whole crowds are shouting to him, Hoel Psalms, that he is the gate, that he's the cornerstone, that he's the blessed one. Hosanna, save us now is what Hosanna means. Save us now, rescue us, deliverer. Do what you came to do. We know you're here for that. We know it's going to happen. Even though he's on this donkey colt, which always gave, when a leader at those times was riding around on a donkey colt or on some kind of a donkey, it meant times of peace. You don't ride into war on that, right? 
That's embarrassing. That is going to war in a Prius, you know? I'm here. I'm like, no, no, you're not. Where's the Abrams battle tank? Where's the big white war horse? He'll come on that too, won't he? He'll come on that too. I think of them scratching their heads watching him ride that donkey. And yet that was prophecy fulfilled as well, wasn't it? It was. Again, what's the point, Pastor Ben? You get long-winded, you're excited about stuff. what's, What's the point? For this purpose, Jesus came. Prophecy fulfilled. History is his. Prophecy isn't fantasy. Quit letting a 30-second Christianity debunked video wreck your faith for the day. The Bible debunked. It's like enough. If you're going to let that debunk your whole faith and upset your whole cart, it's like take the opportunity to study it a little bit, to get into it. 30 seconds, some Yahoo says, well, yeah, this wasn't true. And you're like, oh, I guess it's not true. Next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing you know is you don't even believe in the Bible anymore at all. Where do you come to that conclusion? Studying TikTok. I'm a master at it. I've watched so many videos, I'm sure it's debunked. The guy had a million followers. It's like, what? Mercy. Jesus says, my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this. No, man, this is the purpose that I'm here for. This is what it's all about. Prophecy is fulfilled. Recorded history is finding ultimate meaning in the story of Jesus Christ. You hear that? History finds its meaning through the lens of Jesus, the reality of who he is and what he came to do. And this is what Christians celebrate. This is why we praise him. The next thing is this, for this purpose Jesus came, to glorify the Father, to glorify the Father. John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. See that short prayer of Jesus? Father, he's having hardship. His soul is troubled. He's not shrinking back. He's moving forward. He says, Father, glorify your name. And then the voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Three times in Jesus' earthly ministry, God spoke from heaven, authenticating exactly what it is that Jesus had come to do. At his baptism in Matthew 3.17, at the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration. Again, these are big words and some people like, oh yeah, I know that. And other people like, transfigure what? I don't, Matthew 17.5. This is my beloved son, a booming voice from heaven in whom I am well pleased. I love that. Had Jesus gone to the cross yet? No, but God was still very pleased with his son, very pleased in the ministry that he had endeavored to do, very pleased in the fact that he had continued to be sinless, that he is the sinless sacrifice, that he is the slain lamb, that his blood saves us from impending doom. God was very pleased. And then he says at the transfiguration, listen to him. I think what those guys must have thought of that, like, oh, fair enough. Will do, booming voice, I will do what you say. Can you imagine hearing that? And even even here in John 12, 28, this booming voice, and yet perhaps it was spiritual blindness that kept some of the crowd from hearing it and described, ah, that was weird. Was it thunder? What, What was that? It was God. Was it an angel? It was the Lord. Message from heaven was not for Jesus. It wasn't an encouragement to him. It was an encouragement to us. It was for those faithful few that were around it to hear it because the Son of God is going to die because all of the rejoicing and all of the truth that they had been exposed to of who Jesus really was and they were clinging on to it, the end wasn't going to be the way they thought it was going to be. And so, The voice was here to remind us that I have glorified him and I will glorify him again. We ought to hold on to that. John 8, 29 says this about Jesus glorifying the Father. Jesus' purpose was to glorify the Father. John 8, 29, and he who sent me is with me, Jesus says. God who sent me, God is always with me. He has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. This is Jesus' life. This is his ministry to always do what was pleasing to God. And the mission of Jesus Christ was commissioned by God the Father. The rescue mission was hatched in heaven, and it was carried out on the earth. And this is the purpose that Jesus had come, to glorify his Father, to do what he said to do. 
Jesus did not sin. That brings glory to God. Oh, Jesus faithfully prepared the disciples to take the gospel to the world. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies about the Messiah. Jesus cleansed the temple of robbers and thieves. Religious people who were doing it for money and religious gain, right? Jesus healed the sick. Jesus preached the truth. Jesus glorified God by living out the Father's will and everything that he did to be pleasing to the Father. Jesus glorified the Father. And here's the question for us today. Does your life emulate the Lord Jesus Christ? Does your life to glorify the Father in all that we do. In all that we do. You can glorify the God, God the Father at work, can't you? You can bring him glory in your workplace. You can bring him glory at home. You can bring him glory on your phone. You can bring him glory anywhere, can you not? Jesus says, I had come to glorify the Father. Everything that I do is to bring him glory and honor and praise. This is what the Lord is concerned with. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. I love, I love, it's like, why glorify God? What's, we should ask difficult questions of ourselves and our faith often. Why glorify God? Why should I go around being this do-gooder? What's the point of that? Well, God is real and he's a judge and he created you and he loves you and he's provided for you what you need, not what you want. Psalm 19, 7 through 10 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. You need a restored soul? Are you counting on something else that's perfect? There is none other perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise, making wise the simple. Are you a simple person and you want to be wise? Do you need something sure, a foundation for your feet, a cornerstone perhaps to stand on? The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Are you wondering what's right, what's true? It goes on and on. Verse 10 of Psalm 19. These things, they are more desirable than gold. Yes, much fine gold, sweeter than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Do you want a relationship with God and the wisdom of God more than gold? I'm going to tell you this. You can get gold, but it isn't going to make you pure. You, you can have a lot of gold, but it doesn't give a foundation for your feet. Richest men in the world have died from cancer and other things. All the money in the world can't buy them health and salvation, even a relationship with their own kids half of the time. This is why we glorify God. He's shown us how to do all things right. Will you glorify God with your life? Will you live Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they would see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven, this is what we want to do. And we want to follow Jesus. We want to do what he says. The last thing is this, for this purpose, Jesus came to draw all men to himself, that he is lifted up. And if I'm lifted up from the earth, he says, I will draw all men to myself. And we think, yeah, we want to lift Jesus up, but he was speaking about the cross. What is interesting, and I didn't put this on the screen for you, but the verses following this, John 12, 34, following. The crowd knew when Jesus says that I must be lifted up. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. They knew that meant the cross, which is so weird. That must have just floored them. They're like, verse 34, then the crowd answered, we have heard out of the law, the prophecies, we've heard that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Why would you say that? Why would the Messiah be crucified? For this purpose that Jesus came, to draw all men to himself. Friends, the cross of Jesus Christ has become very familiar to some of us, but we ought to think again on the spectacle of the cross. There are Good Friday services happening around our community. We won't be having one here, but I would encourage you to consider the cross on Friday, to consider the spectacle of the cross, an unfair trial, a man wrongly tried, an innocent man nailed to a tree between two sinners. The whole world that's shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, is looking on and screaming, crucify, crucify. The man who is trending for being the Savior is trending now for being a liar. And the good news of the cross, that we would stare upon that good news, that we would know that he's drawing all men to himself, that the good news is that on that dark Friday that we call good, we remember a Savior, the shed blood of a lamb, 
that through the cross he would draw all men to himself, that he has been lifted up, that human history has crosses everywhere from, from that point forever forward, a torture device reminding all people who would look onto the cross that salvation is there, that it's truly a crossroads for every human person to trust Jesus or to go their own way, to continue on the path that's broad that leads to destruction and to turn under the narrow way that leads to life and life abundant, that they would give all things unto the Savior, that they would trust him with their days, that they would trust him with their value systems, that they would trust those prophecies and say, you know what, that was true. And I'll give him my life. And when he said he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through him, and that he said, by faith, you come to the cross. And we say, we'll do that, Lord Jesus, we'll do that. Jesus came for this purpose, to fulfill prophecy, to glorify the Father, to draw all men to himself. This Passion Week, let's draw to the Father, amen? Let's use this opportunity that we have, this relationship with God, to be reminded about all that he's done for us. Let's not be the curmudgeon, frown-faced, rascally Christians. We'll be the ones that are celebrating, we're happy, we're remembering, we're lifting our eyes to heaven, we're lifting our eyes to this cross, and we're remembering what he paid for us, and we're remembering, man, we've got a cornerstone. It was rejected by the world, but it's become the most important part. Cornerstone. As the worship team comes up today, let's just come to the cross, you know, humbly and broken. So many of us have come to that old rugged cross, haven't we? And we come to it again and again, remembering that victory is there, remembering that peace is there, remembering that Jesus has overcome death. God and man meet at the cross. Payment is made, forgiveness is received, and new life is born at the cross. Friends, let's all stand this morning. See, today we, we think about the cross and we think about Jesus' earthly life and we think about the humility of it all. But can I tell you that next week, a week from today, when we gather for Easter, Jesus wasn't just lifted up onto a cross, was he? He ascended into heaven, that he rules and reigns alive. He's got flesh. You could touch him. You could find him and hug him, that he, he reigns in glory, that he is lifted up and exalted never to be humiliated like that again. And so we, we sing in victory this morning. We sing to a risen Lord now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we know that you rose from death. And we know that you have an ear to hear and eyes to see and a mouth that speaks. We don't worship some vain thing. And we don't crumple up our mind and throw it away when we come to you, Lord. We, we take the things that we see and the things that we know and the, the relationships that we have, and we bring them all to you, Lord, and we say, would you help us, Lord Jesus? Save us now. Hosanna. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, would they just trust you with everything in their life? It's called repentance. It's called just turning and confessing that you've done it wrong and following him. And for the rest of us believers... Should there not be joy written all over our face? For we know the depravity of our own heart. We know the sin that we so quickly entangle ourselves in. And we know the love and the grace that you so quickly pour out on us, Lord Jesus. You did it right. You glorified your Father all the way to the end. Father, let us glorify you with our lives. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.